And it's the physics video lecture once again. PSI 168 video lecture 21. We're talking about thermal physics and I have a few familiar, I familiar items over here and then I've got a stick of butter over there. So let's see where this goes. So let's first always review our progression here. So, of course we wanted to make our way back to the energy concept and we're essentially there, but when we started thermal physics it was just the idea that there are hot and cold things. So we had the sensation of hot and cold. We then have thermal expansion as an interesting phenomenon that you know, goes with this sensation, maybe with the hot and cold, and not so much the sensation, you don't want to actually burn yourself, okay, you get thermal expansion, and from that we get thermometers and temperature scales, and we'll primarily be using the Celsius scale but we also need the Kelvin scale, and they have the same increments, okay? So thermometers and temperature scales. So then I brought in the gas thermometer. And the analysis of what was going on in the gas thermometer, even this one here, as well as the more general discussion, showed us that we actually do have work going on. So a byproduct of a thermal process can be work. And where there's work, there's energy, right? Energy is potential to do work. And if you take into account that there is, uh, that there are atoms and molecules, and that's what a gas is uh, composed of, then you can go even further. So with the gas thermometer, we have work. And from work, we immediately have potential energy. Then if you take atomism into account, you also have kinetic energy. Atomism, kinetic energy. And so we're already in the energy discussion again, although we started out just with hot and cold. But we have to do a little more discussion before we can finally quantify the entire energy. So what we're doing next here is heat. We discuss what we call heat um, and then thermal energy. And once we have this next subject down, we'll be able to go to a full discussion of energy again in which thermal energy is just another constituent. So heat and thermal energy. So my next demonstration, I'm going to make a candle using a stick of butter. So first of all, I just have butter and one brand is as good as the next. So you have butter and what you do is you read on the label that there are 32 servings per container. The container has a pound of butter in it, four quarter pound sticks. So 800 calories per stick of butter. And right here it says calories 100 per serving, okay? Good. And it says some other stuff. Ingredients, cream, okay? So here's what we do. Um, now this is gonna look like a cooking show for a minute here. But we're gonna take this butter Unwrap it. And I want to make a candle, so I need a wick. Now, you need a cotton string. I'm going to stress that, and I'm also going to make an excuse. Ran out of my own cotton string, found this backstage here, and I think it's fairly cotton like. So, what you do is you press this string into your butter. 
the butter's not too soft, not too hard. You can press it right in there. Now it's in the middle of the butter. Close it up. Okay. So this is the wick. And pull it one end of it. And I'll just cut the end off with the scissors here. Wish me luck. Okay. There, that's our candle. Got some extra string at the bottom there. Okay. So let's see if this thing will burn. It's going to be a homework project for you guys if this works. Now we're talking. Do I have to bring that up to the camera? Make sure it's visible. Okay. There's our butter candle. Oh, not bad. Screen capture maybe, but you guys actually want to make your own. Proof of concept, butter candle. Okay, we're not done with this butter candle. Because, okay. Okay, good. So, let me make sure this thing is set up nice and upright. Now I want to explain what a calorie is, right? Supposedly the butter had 800 calories in this you know what, I'm going to bring it up there again. It's making a sound. Okay, the reason it's making that roasting sound is because there's water in the butter. Butter's not pure fat, some amount of water. Okay, the next picture here I want to show you what a calorie is. This is of course not a functioning calorimeter. It's the idea though. The idea, and I'm going to draw this as a cartoon, we'll always have this. The idea is that I would have water in this beaker of a certain amount and I would have this flame of course closer to it and the flame would heat the water and the value on the thermometer would rise, okay? So there's a relationship between the temperature of water and the change of temperature of water. You know what, I can feel the heat from this thing, how nice. Relationship between the temperature of water and the increase in temperature of water when you apply something hot to it and the calorie. And that's what I'm gonna give you next. Let's see how good this picture comes out. It's visible. Let's give this a little turn so that the thing's not in the way. Okay, not a huge flame, but no doubt that we had a butter candle here. Okay, so I'm going to blow it out and I'll keep explaining what's going on here. Good. So yeah, you want to make a nice sketch. That's our that's our go-to cartoon for calories. Okay. Good. So the demonstration was the butter candle, and I can get rid of some of this stuff now. In fact, bring this over here.
Okay, back to work. <clears throat> So we have the butter candle. For butter, you need cotton string. Apparently that was cotton string that I used because what you'll find if you have nylon string, it just immediately burns up and melts. So you need cotton string and then from now on we'll draw our candles like this. Okay, You draw, you pull the cotton string through the candle, through the butter, you just press it in the way I showed you, and then you actually get a flame there. In honor of that flame, we'll make it red and blue. Okay. Good, so we have our butter, but we're not done yet. So for our cartoon, we have a stand here. We're on a table. We have a beaker with water in it. And we have in here a thermometer. And a little red in there. Celsius. So very clearly, the butter candle, the butter here, which has calories, according to the label, heats the water in the beaker, and it raises the temperature of the water in the beaker, which we can then read off on the, on the thermometer. Okay. The candle. You know what? Let's call this a homework. Everybody's got to try this. So make your butter candle, make it work. There's no waste, by the way. When I'm done, I'm just going to pull the wick out again and I'll have the rest of the butter to eat. Okay. So make a butter candle and send me a picture okay, with your notes, if you can pull it off. Okay, it's not that hard. So butter, cotton string, very important. You got a candle. Now, what is a calorie? One calorie that's spelled with a capital C is the amount of heat that will raise one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. So I'm just going to write equal raises the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. So a stick of butter could raise the temperature of 800 kilograms of water by one degree Celsius, Celsius and any other combination you can think of. But yeah, this definition you have to know and know it well. We'll talk about it a lot. That's right, I'm only using this lower board. Good. So there's a calorie. It's the amount of heat or thermal energy that will raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. This is also referred to as the kilocalorie. Kilocalorie, because the calorie lowercase, okay, notice we've got uppercase here, lowercase equals one one thousandth of an uppercase calorie. But the thing is, the one that's spelled uppercase is actually the food calorie. That's what we talked about when we talked about a calorie of food. So I'm going to write here food calorie. And then we'll talk a little bit more about calories. See, this process of burning something and heating water, that gives a, an operational definition of how to find the calories of anything you want to know. You just burn it. Now suppose you wanted to know the number of calories in a head of lettuce or in a certain amount of lettuce. 
the lettuce is mostly water, you'd have to dry the lettuce out till it's just fibery and maybe grind it down into a little powder and then you would burn that powder that used to be lettuce or those little dry leaves and you'd see how much heat comes out, how much, you know, the temperature of water can be raised and that'll tell you the calories of that food. And the same goes for everything. And uh, nowadays they know the ingredients to food, so they'll just say how many ingredients went into the food and they can figure out how many calories it has. Um, so, for example, to find the calories, like I just said, of lettuce or anything else, you have to dry it um, and, uh, and burn it. And burn it in such a way that you can measure the increase of uh, temperature of a certain amount of water. Now my setup here is nice for the cartoon, but of course most of the heat is going every, you know, out the sides and stuff. So the thing has to be properly encased so no heat is lost. But yeah, so now we can talk about, so example, lettuce, etc., etc. So you burn it to find the calories. So next, let's talk about heat of combustion. So there are typical calories, um, typical amounts of heat of combustion for different substances. And since we're on the subject of food, we can talk about fat, protein, carbohydrate, and alcohol. And roughly, these have nine calories per gram, four per gram, four calories per gram, and seven calories per gram. So this, this, this would be what you call the heat of combustion, the amount of calories per gram of a, or per unit, per unit mass, calories per unit mass. All right, calories per unit mass. So if this was a homework, this is a fun homework, but also I would like you guys to look these up in some more detail. These are the rough numbers that anyone can memorize and remember. And you guys probably, a lot of you probably know these numbers just as well as I do from having read them somewhere, probably on a food label or something. But check these, um, check uh, for more accurate numbers. These are clearly the rounded numbers. So get some foods or get some different fats, for example, you can look for olive oil, butter we already know, but it's got some water in it. You can do different olive oil, lard, that type of thing. So for different fats, and the same for other substances as well. Even different alcohols will have, uh, pure alcohol, but still different types will have um, different calories per gram. So what you want to do is look, at, look for a few of these and print them out and put them in your book. Okay, so you have a little more of a record, but Fact of the matter is you can actually live with these four, and I'll tell you why. Because these heats of combustion are pretty much the range of heats of combustion. So for example, suppose you wanted to know gasoline of the type you put in your car, okay? It would have heats of combustion on the order of nine, 10 calories per gram, okay? So this, so fat basically, tells you what fuel has, okay? And these two here, proteins and carbohydrates, if you were burning wood or something, then you would be in this regime here. And coal and all other things, they're somewhere in between. They're somewhere in this range, you know, between four and 10 or so. And 10, of course, is a great number. When we do estimates, we'll just use 10, and you know, we'll be, we'll be done before we start. So heat of combustion, I want you to go look some of those up as well. Add them to your 
uh, materials. And try to do the demo of the butter can. Okay, so once we have the calorie, and since we already knew that there was energy involved, the question now is, is there a conversion between calories and joules? Right, because joules is the world of mechanical energy, and so far calories are the world of, of thermal energy, but we're going to see there's a direct relation between the two. So that's our next topic, the relation between calories and joules. So yeah, I'm going to erase this, but yeah, I'll draw this more often than this time. This cartoon here, you got your, can you got your butter candle, you got your water, you got your thermometer, and we have our definition. Okay, so next. And this terminology calorie comes from an old term caloric where heat was actually regarded as a fluid at one point in time. You know, they thought heat would flow into one substance, flow out of another. And so we had the term caloric. So it comes from there, but now what we want to talk about is thermal physics and mechanics. Mechanics is what we all, thermal physics is the calorie and mechanics is the joule. Okay. So are they related? And here's a very easy experiment. You just rub your hands together. Rub your hands together and they get warm. They definitely feel warm. And how is that? This is work. This is force times displacement. Between my hands is friction. Okay. And work and friction produce heat. Okay. So Joule, who was a physicist, came up with the churn. So we're going to call this the Joule churn. And again, why don't you guys see if you can get some images? Because my picture of the jewel churn is very poor. In fact, what I'm going to do is just do this idea here. Imagine you had a handle, and so this is a, a vessel, a little keg of water of some type. You've got a handle here that you can crank, and you've got a propeller inside. Okay. So you crank the propeller and because there's water in here, Jules Churn was not a propeller, I'll tell you that, but I can't draw what he did. You guys look it up. So the point is, if you crank this handle, you're cranking it, you're turning it against resistance, it means you're doing work. Okay. Force times displacement, every time I crank this thing, one turn, that's two pi radius, so that's a displacement. It took me a force to do it the whole time, okay? So I'm doing work, and the water inside here warms up, okay? We've got water. Here we'll say, turn the crank, turn the handle. Turn the crank. We do work. And of course, we have a thermometer in here celsius so we do work and we raise the temperature of the water inside but the amount of work we do can be very carefully quantified and this thing can be insulated and so the temperature increase is solely due to the work that we did okay so that's the jewel churn so turn the crank that does work temperature increases temperature increases and what you have in there is friction, internal friction
friction, the, the resistance to turning the crank. For example, if you turn this crank in air, the propeller turns really easily. If you do it in water, it takes more resistance, okay? So there's more friction there. So here's what Joule finds out. He finds out that one food calorie, after he measures how much work he did and how much temperature increased, equals 4,186 joules. An amazing result. Okay. Nothing was lost. Okay, The thing's insulated. We'll talk about insulation later in the semester. The thing's insulated, turn the crank, temperature goes up. So this is referred to as the mechanical equivalent of heat. equivalent of heat. I generally ask that on an exam. What is a mechanical equivalent of heat? And what you want to do is answer this equation for starters, but then you want to explain this equation. Because this is a really rich equation. The way you can think of it is the left side here, this is all of the thermal physics we've taught, we've talked about, okay? Well, thermal physics. So there's a lot to talk about before you get to the concept of a calorie, right? We had to do a bit. Over here, this is mechanics. That is to say all the physics of kilograms, meters, and seconds. Okay. And what about the equal sign? Equal sign is due to friction. Okay, that's, how it, that's how it works. And what we're doing at this point is also very important. We're doing the work and creating the heat. So I could have an arrow, you know, we'd go the work and create the heat. So if I drew an arrow here, it would be in this direction. Mechanical work produced heat, right? Mechanical work here produced heat. But this amount is very interesting, 4,000 roughly 4,000 joules, that was the work for the stair climb that I used to say when I took my 800 newtons up the five meter stairs, okay? That was one calorie, it was 4,000 joules, it turns out that's the equivalent of one calorie. Okay. For example, if you were to slide down a slide with a lot of friction so the seat of your pants gets warm, then if you did a five meter slide like that, you come down at the bottom and that would be one calorie of heat, calorie of heat that would be distributed throughout your body. Okay. Um, other examples are if a big truck or even an automobile is going down a hill and puts on the brakes. You've heard about the brakes getting hot or if you come down the grapevine, you actually smell the, the brake linings of the, of the big, big rigs. Okay. Brake linings of the big rigs have gotten hot and burn to some degree, you can smell that driving down the grapevine. That's the work, mechanical work is the potential energy of those trucks as they go down the hill, increasing is being turned into heat, okay? So many, many examples of this conversion of mechanical energy into heat. And that's called the mechanical equivalent of heat. Later in the semester, after we've studied this some more, we have to be pretty thorough about it all. Later in the semester, we're gonna figure out how to take heat and turn it into useful work. But for now, we only know this direction of the arrow. Okay, good, so far so good. Food calorie. Okay, the next topic now that we have this equivalence, we can, in a sense, we can abandon the calorie. We're not strictly going to abandon it, but uh, we can, if we want, now s just talk about joules again. Because we know that fuel, which has a caloric content, you know, can be related to a joule content. But only when we have both directions of this arrow will we really have the subject under control. 
So we'll get there. Let's see how we're doing time wise here. Oh, okay. Okay, so now we're going to just talk about um, thermal energy. And the idea is going to be that I'm going to use the letter capital Q for thermal energy. And the idea is this, we have some object, this could be a beaker full of water, it could be any number of things, has a certain mass, and we're going to put thermal energy into that mass. For example, we could put the fire under the beaker of water and warm it up. So Q is going into this mass M, and it changes the temperature. So thermal energy Q uh, changes the temperature of an object. And here's the formula. Q is equal to MC delta T. We're going to use this a fair amount. So, so far, we'll write that's um, heat, we can call it heat, and it's going to be measured in joules. Okay. This is going to be the mass in kilograms. And this here is the change in temperature in degrees Celsius. Okay. So what is this thing here? This is called the specific heat capacity. So it's a material constant. Different materials have different specific heat capacities. And what we're going to do is just take this as an equation um, and solve for C. Oh, let me point one more thing out. If this delta T is positive, it means the heat flows in. If the delta T is negative, it means the heat flows out. Okay. But for now, we'll just always think the heat flows in. It could be a flame. It could be whatever. You could be rubbing the thing, it could be friction, and it raises the temperature. Okay, so we have that definition here, this formula. We're going to solve for T. So Q equals MC delta T, and C is equal to Q divided by M times delta T. And when I do the square brackets, I'm just getting the units, which is something we want to know. Okay, So the units of Q over M times delta T the units in the numerator are joules, denominator kilograms and degrees Celsius. So the specific heat capacity has the units of joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. Now we're going to set up a table, specific heat capacities. Okay, and I'm already going to erase this, give a little more room. And the units are going to be joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Very important for you guys. And I'm going to start with water and ice. You'd think ice is just water, but they're different states of matter and they have different specific heat capacities. Water has 4,186. We could have actually guessed that because we knew about the calorie. Okay. Put the definition of the calorie in here and the, and, and the 
mechanical equivalent teeth and get exactly that number. Okay, so this one we could have guessed, but ice has 2,090 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. I'm gonna write this really clearly, because what I want for your homework, joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. There are different units, there are different ways to measure the specific heat capacity. But I want you to find these, and then find, you know, a half a dozen or a dozen more and either print them out or complete a table for your notes. If you print them out, you want to include in your notes. So homework, a table of specific heat capacities. Okay. And the reason is you want, to, you want to get an idea of the range. It's interesting that water is the highest in nature. Water has the highest specific heat capacity and surprisingly, metals um, are much lower. I think copper is around 400. Glass is around 400. Lead is around 100. Okay. And what that means is, if you go back to this definition here, for a given amount of heat, you know, say you put so and so many joules in, the higher the specific heat capacity, the lower the smaller the change in temperature. You know, a watched pot never boils. You ever hear that? You have to put a lot of heat into water to bring it up to a high temperature. Other substances, you know, per kilogram, other substances heat up much, much faster. So yeah, if you write down a dozen, half a dozen or a dozen of these in your table, and make sure you choose this unit here. That's the one we're using. You know, it can be done in terms of calories per gram or other things you want. Joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So you get a table of specific heats for your notes. Um, let's see. That's probably a good place for us to call it. Yeah, that's good. So we've got specific heat capacity. Let's see how we want to wrap this up and where we are going next with this. Um, we have a few, we have a number of topics. By showing you the mechanical equivalent heat, I've already told you where we're headed. We want to learn about heat engines. We want to learn about taking fuel and turning it into useful work, right? Very important for our civilization. All of your cars, most power generation uses that. So we have a ways to go, but uh, we're going to be thorough about it. We're not, miss we're not leaving out any steps. This is a very important quantity. And once again, it's for different materials, you give a certain amount of heat into them, and depending upon the amount of the material and its the specific heat capacity, this property, you get different changes in temperature. Okay, so yeah, this we'll be using repeatedly throughout the semester. Um, but we'll leave it at that for now. And next time we'll just move on. We have more thermal physics topics to do. Okay, good. See you guys next time.